could you introduce yourself and talk about your work? I'm Katrin Preller. I'm uh, doing psychedelic research at the University of Zurich. And we've been doing a lot of mechanistic studies on the effects of, for example, psilocybin and LSD on the brain, doing a lot of neuroimaging as well, trying to figure out what exactly these substances do in the brain. And more recently, we've also translated some of this research into clinical populations, trying to find out if psilocybin can help patients with alcohol use disorder and with depression, and if they do, why they are actually helping patients. I know it's a difficult question, but I ask, what do they exactly do with our brain, psychedelics? Yeah, so once psychedelics enter the brain, they first uh, stimulate the so-called serotonin 2A receptor. That's an excitatory receptor that means that it is increasing the likelihood that our neuron becomes active. Serotonin 2A receptors are distributed across the whole brain, but in some areas they are more densely expressed than in others. And that means that um, if the firing of our neurons is different because the serotonin 2A receptor is stimulated, that also means that information is process differently in the brain. And what we see when we do fMRI studies is that, uh, first of all, the thalamus, so the structure in our brain, which is filtering information, is more open. So the filtering function is reduced, sending more information to the cortex. And then in the cortex, we see that our sensory brain regions, so the brain regions which are responsible for seeing and hearing, etc., those are very much in sync, probably um, leading to this heightened sensory experience. At the same time, the brain areas which are responsible for integrating this information, for making sense of this information, bringing it together, they are loosely connected to the rest of the brain, probably leading to um, a new way of integrating information and therefore maybe also um, the feeling of being able to um, challenge old perceptions, finding a new way of looking at yourself, of looking at the world. And that might actually then be very helpful for patients to be able to step out of rigid thinking patterns or ruminous thinking, um, which, for example, depressed patients suffer from, and just finding a new outlook on the world. So what is the practical importance of, of this kind of research on the brain? Uh, how can they contribute to a better understanding of how we use psychedelics in treatment? Right now, um, we are starting to understand what exactly is happening in the brain after we've taken a psychedelic. Um, and that is, of course, very helpful uh, to understand how the brain is, for example, creating all these experiences that psychedelics induce. In terms of how this relates to clinical effects, so um, what of these, all of these effects that we see, how do they relate to improvement in symptoms in patients? That is a lot more difficult. So there are clinical trials which are now also using mechanistic endpoints to also answer these questions, but we have just very few data at the moment. So right now we have a lot of hypotheses. What is happening that is then leading to these symptom improvements, but none of them has, they have either not been tested in, in humans or the evidence is still you know, based on very few studies. So at this point we need to say we, we don't know. We have a lot of hypotheses, some of them very biological, like induced neuroplasticity, um, alterations in brain networks, some more on the psychological level, like increased insight into dysfunctional behavior, increased social connectedness. But what it really is, or whether it's a combination of many things, is something we just don't know at this point. Can you explain us what neuroplasticity is and how is it associated with the use of psychedelics? So what we have seen in animal studies is that after the administration of a psychedelic, we see that there are new synapses in the brain, so new um, parts that connect different neurons. Um, so there is something happening in the brain. The brain is changing and it has the capacity to learn new things or maybe forget old things. Um, however, that means um, at this point, this has only been shown in animals. So we have no idea whether this is actually also present in humans. If it were, and if we can show that this happens, that means that there might be a window of opportunity where um, patients 
can, in a way, reorganize their brain where they can um, learn new things, um, new behaviors that help them to, uh, to tackle the problems they are struggling with, or maybe even forget old associations. For example, in, um, in, in addiction disorders, there's often a strong association between um, specific drug cues, like um, a wine glass, for example, and the urge to drink wine. Um, and if we can loosen this connection, this would certainly help people. So this may be something where neuroplasticity can be really helpful for the treatment of um, patients. However, we need to find out whether that is actually a mechanism that is present in humans. Do you think it's the experience, the subjective experience itself, that has this uh, medical benefit, or there is an underlying biological benefit that explains this? We just don't know right now. It, um, it may be a purely biological mechanism that also works without the subjective experience, um, but it's also, it could also be the opposite, that it's mainly the um, psychoactive nature of these drugs that um, then um, lead to clinical improvements. For the time being, we don't know. It may also be a combination of both that is helpful for patients, but um, that is something that we, we just don't have the data to answer right now. We will need to run studies to find out. Do we know what kind of individuals respond positively to psychedelic treatment and who are, who do not? Also, still an open question at this point. The reason why we don't really know that is because um, the studies that we've conducted are usually in with a sample size of like 20, 25, and that is not enough people to be really able to make these associations. But as we collect more data, I think we are getting closer. We've already seen that the way our brain is organized um, in, in our regular state has something to do with how it is reacting to psychedelics, or at least how strongly it is reacting to psychedelics. We have not been able to really look at the quality of the experience because of the low sample sizes, but the more data we collect, the better we will be able to characterize that. What can we learn from brain imaging studies? So how can we connect what we see on these brain images to the subjective experiences of people? It is certainly possible. Um, however, as I said, we, we really need um, larger studies to be able to reliably do that. But um, we have definitely uh, looked at things like emotional responses, for example, and we see that there is something happening in the amygdala, for example, and that relates to um, emotional processing under the influence of a psychedelic. So, yeah, we are getting closer, but um, there, is, there are many different methods out there, and as I said, the sample sizes are still really small. So to make this association reliable, we definitely need more data and larger studies. But we are getting there and I think um, we are starting to understand what is happening in the brain and how that relates to how the brain is, um, is reacting to external input. How can we compare the experiences caused by psychedelics to other altered states of consciousness such as hypnosis or meditation? We just recently ran an analysis where we compared LSD psilocybin to um, meditation and hypnosis. And actually to our surprise, what we found is that these states, at least when we look at the brain, are completely different. So psilocybin is very similar to LSD, but both of them are different from meditation, and meditation again is different from hypnosis. So um, we, there, there is almost no overlap when we look at the brain patterns. Um, that, first of all, was a surprise because they share some phenomenology, so what people are experiencing in these states share some overlap. Um, however, it seems that the underlying neuronal pattern is different, so something different is causing these experiences. Um, on the one hand, this is a really good finding because that might mean that these different methods can work synergistically and each of them can contrib contribute something to clinical improvement eventually. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of need to find out um, where the similarities are then and what is you know, giving rise to these specific experiences. Or maybe these experiences can arise from different underlying neuronal patterns. All of that is possible. So we definitely need to do more research into the direction of what is, very, what is specific about the psychedelic experience compared to other altered states. 
What are the main questions you think the researchers should answer in the following few years? Uh, for me, the key question is really finding out about the mechanism of action. Why do these states um, or why do these substances help people? So making this connection, I think, will be the key question to answer in the near future. And based on these answers, we should then consider optimizing our therapeutic approach. And that means in terms of dose, in terms of dosing frequency, in terms of non-pharmacological therapy that comes as a package with, uh, the, with the psychedelic administration. And I think these are the things and the questions that are really pressing and that we need to answer in the very near future. What is your personal feeling about psychedelics? Because there is a big hype and big expecta high expectations about psychedelics. What do you think? Uh, is, it, is it only a hype or, 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 or will the reality be worse than the expectations? I, I think the data, if you're, if you're looking closely at the data, we already see that psychedelics are helping some people, but they don't help everyone. And I think that is something that the data are already showing us today and that is something that we need to understand that this is not going to be a magic bullet that helps cure the world, but it may be a very promising mechanism that may be able to help uh, people, especially people who may not benefit from other therapeutic approaches right now. And I think um, that is very, very promising and that is something that we need to invest and study more, but we need to be aware that this is not going to be the therapy that just helps everyone.